Hi, Mick McQuaid here for IST E782 Visual Analytics. And today I'd like to discuss a paper by Hadley Wickham called Layered Grammar of Graphics. Our story thus far is that Jacques Beltin proposed the semiology of graphics, then Leland Wilkinson proposed the grammar of graphics, then Hadley Wickham proposed a layered grammar of graphics. Now Wickham implemented his idea as ggplot2 in our software package and for the remainder of the term we will use ggplot2 to visualize data. Wickham's paper, his 2010 paper, Layered Grammar of Graphics, distinguishes between ggplot2 and Wilkinson's grammar, and the remainder of this slideshow will review that paper at a fairly high level, I, I might add. You really should read the paper. We'll start with an example from the paper. The input is this simple data set, so there are four uh, observations and um, four columns. We'll create a new data set with A mapped to the coordinate to the X coordinate and C mapped to the Y coordinate and D mapped to shape. And we will discard the unused variable which is B. We'll convert to Cartesian coordinates using this formula. We'll convert A to a circle and B to a square. We'll, we'll just call them circle and square and then we'll actually use the symbols circle and square. So given that we have you know a certain um, rectangle area uh, available to us uh, we've scaled these coordinates and we've said what shapes we're going to use and then we can actually transform this data set into a graphic. And so this is the graphic. So it's got two circles and two squares. And the coordinates are, are transformed versions of A and C. And we can do them in facets, so we can show them separately. Now obviously for such a toy data set, it's, you know, it makes no particular difference, but for a real data set it would. The components that we've seen here are the data, the aesthetic mappings, the scales, the facet specification, the statistical transformation, and actually we just used an identity transformation so that, that there was nothing sensational, and the coordinate system, which was the Cartesian coordinate system. Now the layered grammar defines the components of a plot as a default data set and a set of mappings from variables to aesthetics is number one. Number two is one or more layers. Each layer has a geom, a stat. By the way, Wickham uses the term, I can't remember now if I've mentioned it already, uh, geom for geometric object and stat for statistical transformation. Uh, a position adjustment and optionally a data set and a set of aesthetic mappings. Uh, one scale for each aesthetic mapping, a coordinate system, and a facet specification. And here's the layered grammar with the equivalence in the grammar of graphics in parentheses. So Wickham's grammar is defaults, layer, scale, chord, and facet. And you can see it doesn't map exactly to uh, Wilkinson's uh, grammar of graphics equivalents, which are all in caps here, but it's close. Okay, the layer component. So we're going to discuss each of those in turn, except for the defaults. Um, the layer component determines the physical representation of data. Stat and geom in combination define many familiar named graphics, which I think Beltan calls the standard construction, such as scatter plot, histogram, and contour plot. Plots very often have three layers, data, a context, and a statistical summary. And an example of this would be points, a map, and contours of a two-dimensional density estimate on the map. The rationale for a user to be interested in the layered grammar of graphics are that the components are independent so they can be changed individually. So that creates a lot of convenience when you're working, when you're, you know, when you're using this. Um, it provides a frame. It, by the way, it's, you're not going to get the convenience right away. It's, it takes a little bit of learning before you, before you get the, the, uh, the value of the components being independent. Uh, it provides a framework to think about graphics, so it simplifies the trip from mind to paper or from
from mind to screen for that matter, and it encourages the use of graphics that are customized to the particular problem at hand rather than selecting from generic named graphics. So I, I can't tell you how much it influenced um, the way that I approached making graphics um, because I wound up just thinking about them differently, thinking about them much more. The rationale for the developer, so this is the software developer, it makes it easier to create new capabilities, and this has proven to be very important in the history of ggplot2, which is currently the most popular uh, and for a long time has been the most popular plugin for R. Uh, it's got that popularity partly because people have been able to do so, have been able to create so many uh, add-ons for it. And it's useful for discovering new types of graphics since it defines the parameter space. Layers have four parts. So there's the data and aesthetic mapping, the statistical transformation or stat, the geometric object or geom, and the position adjustment, which is just so that objects don't obscure each other. Um, layers have something in common, for example, the underlying data. So an example here is we see, um, if we think back to the uh, plot we did before, we have x and y coordinates and potentially color. So the first x here, uh, the first y, and the word color are all part of the specification. The second x, the second y, and the z are all just names of, of columns of data. Uh, geom line refers to one of about 30 different possible geometric objects, and stat smooth refers to one of about a dozen uh, possible statistical transformations. And any aspect of the example can be supplied directly or left to a default and it's very common. We'll see, we'll see plenty of examples of leaving uh, parts or, or sometimes most of, of what we're doing to, uh, to defaults. Data is independent of other components. So one graphic can be applied to many data sets. And you will apply the same graphic to many data sets. Um, we need to specify which data are mapped to which aesthetics. And a useful graphic needs a good mapping between data and aesthetics. Statistical transformations typically summarize data. Here are some examples of statistical transformations. One is uh, bin, which divides continuous, ra continuous range into bins and counts the points in each. A box plot is simply the computation of the median and fences between the quartiles and the um, outliers that are needed to create a picture of a box plot, um, the calculation of contour lines for a contour plot, um, the calculation of a density estimate, um, an identity transformation, the jittering of values by adding a small random value, uh, the calculation of values for a QQ plot, uh, quantile regression, the smooth conditional mean of y given x, uh, that's just a smooth line. The aggregate values of y given x. And finally, unique, just removing uh, the removal of, of duplicate observations. Geometric objects can be classified by dimensionality. So uh, if there are no dimensions, we're just talking about a point or text that's identified as being at some location. In one dimension, we have a path or an ordered path, or which we can call a line. In two dimensions, we have a polygon or an interval. And all of these are abstract objects, and they could be represented in different ways. For example, you, you can take an interval as an example. You could represent it as a bar. You could represent it as a line. You could represent it as an error bar. Or you could represent it as a ribbon if the variable is continuous. Uh, and every geom has a default stat, and every stat has a default geom. And you'll hear me say that repeatedly. Uh, geometric objects and aesthetics. So a point has position, color, shape, and size. A bar has position, height, width, and fill color. A bar could have corner locations or one corner location and dimensions. Dimension measures, though, don't make sense in polar coordinates. So, for example, height could become radius, but width doesn't become angle. 
scales or functions and their inverses along with parameters. So here are two examples of legends depicting scales. The first one, the left one, is an example of a continuous numeric variable being mapped to the size of a dot. And the second one, the one on the right, has a continuous numeric variable mapped to a line in color space. And the legends show snapshots of this mapping. The parameters here are the shape of the dot and the location and shape of the path through the color space as well as which color space is used. And uh, I'm not going to go into color spaces here, but you can uh, Google HSV or HSL or indeed the expression color space and get plenty of introductory articles about color space. Um, a scale is a three tuple, a function, the function's inverse, and a set of parameters. The function may not have a unique inverse. It may very well be the case that two values map to the same red. Um, the functions in a given plot may be redundant, so using more than one aesthetic to map to the same variable. Um, an example of that would be a value that maps to both red and to a given size. The coordinate system is usually a Cartesian coordinate system, occasionally a polar or um, map projections. Uh, it could be parallel coordinates, could be mosaic plots or projections onto a plane for high dimensions. And coordinate transformations occur after statistical transformations, unlike scaling, which happens before a statistical transformation. Coordinate systems affect the appearance of geoms. For example, polar coordinates make a bar geom into a pie slice, which we saw in the uh, grammar of graphics example of how to make a pie. Faceting is a generalization of something that's often known as conditioned plots or lattice plots or trellis plots. In fact, R uses um, both of those latter terms. It creates small multiples of different subsets of data and supports investigation of patterns across conditions. The layout of facets is always in a Cartesian coordinate system. So here's an example specification of one geom point that's going to, to be a uh, uh, a scatter plot geom on the x and y axis, and um, then there will be a, some other variable that will cause us to have a grid of those x and y um, plots. The default, so it can be tedious to write out the full layered grammar to describe a given plot, such as the plot at right, so ggplot2 has plenty of built-in defaults. We still have to learn the layered grammar but the data exploration process can be often sped up with defaults. So take a good look at this. So this is a scatter plot of caret versus price on log scale, log log scale, and it has a smooth line through it. So here's the full specification of that. So at the top we see ggplot with nothing. Then we have two layers. The first layer is the scatter plot, so that has the geom point and the stats are just identity for um, the stat and position. And the aesthetics are caret is mapped to the x-axis and price is mapped to the y-axis. Then the second layer is that line, that smooth line that r runs at a, um, almost a 45 degree uh, angle through the data. Um, and it's got uh, the geom smooth, the stat smooth, and the method LM, which stands for linear model. And then finally, you see on the, the bottom line here, the scale, the y scale is uh, log to the base 10, the x scale is log to the base 10, and we're using Cartesian coordinates. So this is the full specification. Now, this is exactly the same specification. This, is, this gives us exactly the same plot, but just using defaults, just a shortcut using defaults. So um, the first position expects the x coordinate, the second position expects the y coordinate. And then the other three things we've specified explicitly data equals diamonds, geom equals a uh, combination of point and smooth. So that simply tells us that there are two layers, two geoms, the point geom and the smooth geom. And method only applies to the smooth geom, that's the LM method. And uh, log applies to the scales. So the layered grammar is embedded. It's embedded in the R language. 
R is a host language for the layered grammar, and that provides advantages and disadvantages. Um, the big advantage, of course, is R provides vast resources for programming and statistics. No one would argue with that. One disadvantage is that R causes grammatical restrictions that lead to the use of the plus operator to build ggplot2 plots. So the plus operator is a very inconvenient uh, way to build up ggplot2 uh, plots. And there are other little things that we'll encounter as the term wears on. Okay, now here is what I would call the stairway to heaven of data visualization. This is by far the most famous single data visualization in the world. It's a uh, map of Napoleon's disastrous Russian campaign. Um, and it tells a story of um, a vast number of people dying in the uh, cold Russian winter. Um, I call it the stairway to heaven of data visualization because it's um, uh, just so pervasive for beginners to try to uh, emulate it. There's even a contest um, to emulate it. And so, of course, Wickham tries his hand at, at emulating it. I think this, I, it seems to me that I did this based on code that uh, Wickham provided with the, uh, the article. It seems to me I looked up the the code from the article it didn't exactly work, but with a little bit of tweaking, uh, it worked. And I can put that code on on uh, my courses. The code that you actually get, that you actually download with the article, I th it seems to me didn't work out of the box. But anyway, uh, there is a vast amount of code available. Many many people have have uh, done the uh, encoding of Menard's map. Um, Wickham discusses the implications of the layered grammar, and there are three that are significant histograms, polar coordinates, and variable transformations. So uh, histograms are a combination of a binning uh, stat and a bar geom, and don't have to be specified explicitly. So for example, here is a ggplot specification for a histogram that doesn't mention the word histogram at all, but it's a perfectly valid, it creates a perfectly valid histogram. Here are two other ways of specifying the same histogram, both of which do uh, mention the term histogram. Um, now, uh, histogram uh, bin width does have to be adjusted manually. And Wickham explained, we use the term explained loosely here, the default is requiring you to think about the proper bin width, which can be selected as follows for example. This is from Stack Overflow. And you don't need to know the details of this. Um, simply that bin width has been selected here uh, based on some uh, options to the hist function and option to the options to the pretty function that um, make it conform to the uh, particular data, which is a thousand randomly normally random normally distributed uh, points rather than uh, what the default would give. So the, as I say, the details aren't, aren't that important. The idea is that you have to have some method of choosing the bin width. You can't just choose the, the uh, you can't leave the bin width to the default. Okay, the second thing that he discusses the implications of are polar coordinates. So pie charts and radar plots are popular in business, and they're formed using polar coordinates. And it parameterizes the plane in terms of an angle theta and a radius r. And you can convert a point to uh, Cartesian coordinates um, just using these two equations, r times the cosine of theta and r times the sine of theta to get x and y coordinates. And you can choose which variable to map to theta and which variable to map to r. And it can be useful to tweak the range of the radius. So you can get donut plots that are popular. I, I see them a lot. They're like pie charts, except without a center. Uh, the angle is useful for cyclical data, which we'll see in a couple of slides from now, famously used by Florence Nightingale. Here's a pie chart example. And what I want you to notice about this is that uh, x is 
mapped to nothing. So by mapping x to nothing, um, each wedge of the pi goes all the way out um, because we, we converted to po uh, polar coordinates. We made theta be uh, y. Um, the uh, angle is determined by the um, by clarity by the count of clarity. Now, angle is determined by I don't know what. It, let's see. Honestly, I don't remember. It doesn't it's not that important. Um, the important thing here is that is um, that x is not mapped to anything. Oh, and the other thing that's important here is that well, I've used the color brewer scale, so you can just Google the expression color brewer and see how it says scale fill brewer. And palette is equal to yellow, green, blue. That's Y L G M B U. If, if you just um, uh, check R's help for scale fill brewer, you'll get what all the different uh, color brewer combinations are that are available. But it, you don't actually see what the colors look like. But um, you can just Google color brewer and you can see what the colors look. You know, you can get a, a, a picture of these colors. Um, that's very useful. We'll talk more about color brewer later. It's it's a uh, system by a scientist named Brewer who did a lot of experiments on people to see what they um, to see uh, how they reacted to um, different, mainly maps of uh, like chloropleth maps uh, of different variables and. Uh, whether they could answer questions about those maps um, and what colors, how colors influenced their ability to answer questions about those maps. So she created this system called Color Brewer for doing that, and it's incorporated into ggplot2. It's incorporated into R. It's incorporated into a lot of statistics uh, and data analysis programs. But anyway, let me move on here to changing the uh, x from nothing to x equals clarity. You can change the pie chart on the previous slide to a coxcomb plot, which is the plot type that Florence Nightingale used to depict uh, seasonal troop fatalities from diseases and other causes. She uh, created a, uh, plots like this that were very influential on the British Parliament in providing medical attention to troops because they assumed that troops were being killed by gunshot wounds when, in fact, they were being killed by the infections um, that were caused by the gun gunshot wounds. And the infections obviously were preventable. Um, transformations is the third thing. So uh, you can transform the data, you can transform the scales, and you can transform the coordinate system. And transforming the data or scale produce similar looking plots, but transforming the coordinate system can be used to straighten out curved relationships or to show data at different scales together. And we'll see some examples of that as the term goes on. Okay, so one question that uh, Wickham doesn't answer, and he's kind of explicit about not that the grammar of graphics doesn't answer it, and in, instead he provides some some guidelines outside of the grammar of graphics, is the distinction between good and bad graphical practice. And this reminds me that recently Tufty, the famous uh, graphics pundit, <coughs> has complained that R isn't good for producing graphics. And of course, the R community took umbrage at uh, Tufty's claim. He's, you know, he's quite famous, so of course they had to respond to. It. They couldn't just dismiss it. Uh, one interesting thing was, I guess, unbeknownst to Tufty, some of the examples that he used of good graphics uh, had actually been produced in R. So um, the response of the R community was um, producing good graphics is the responsibility of the analyst. Um, the program doesn't guarantee good graphics. So um, there are some problems and solutions that are independent of, of the grammar of graphics. And there are four of them shown here. So too many variables. Um, if there are more than three variables in a single panel, they're hard to read, so he suggests faceting. Um, and by the way, this is his opinion, so there has been research on how many variables are too many to 
to read, and not all of it agrees with him. Uh, Overplotting may mask the true distribution of points, so he suggests contour plotting or uh, color schemes. Uh, alphabetical ordering as a default may limit the usefulness of a plot, so he suggests ordering by a property of the data, for example, the mean or the median. And polar coordinates, people are better at, and this is another controversial claim, people are better at judging length than angle or area, so he suggests using Cartesian coordinates. In fact, there has been research on both sides of this question, and um, you may uh, want to investigate uh, in fact, it, it's just generally a good idea to try to keep up to date on psychometric research and uh, also to investigate research results to see which ones you think are more, more likely to be valid than others or whether there are some underlying causes. I personally suspect that our vision processing system is so good that it can often overcome problems in visualizations, and so that gives rise to conflicting uh, results in different studies of the same phenomena. Uh, how can developers help this? So Wickham uh, surveys a number of attempts to build or specify tools to improve graphical practice and these include calculating a measure of interest for a range of possible plots and displaying the highest scoring. We've actually seen an example of this in uh, Tableau with the uh, Show Me panel. Um, exploring parameter spaces um, is another one. So um, Wickham goes into some more detail about these and gives uh, references for these. I'm not going to go into these in, in detail. Um, he does talk about his future work, so he s says that area plots may require a subgrammar, and it turns out now that uh, lots of people have added um, different plot types to ggplot2 in the years since Wickham wrote this article. So not only area plots, but other plots get a subgrammar now. Um, user interaction, so he has added no user interaction to this. And um, user interaction is potentially very important. Uh, adding sliders, so um, either you have seen or I will show you uh, Hans Rosling's famous um, Gapminder uh, speech in which he used a slider to uh, um, eliminate some data. Um, ggplot2 just produces static panels. There's no sliders, there's no zooming, there's no panning, there's no linked brushing. Uh, all these are, are things that have been available for um, many years in uh, graphics applications, um, but they're not in ggplot2. Uh, and objects beyond data frames. So there are plenty of objects of interest. Mixed effects models or is an example. He gives MANOVAs, clusterings, classification. So these are all statistical objects of interest that are not explored uh, by ggplot2. Only data frames are explored by ggplot2. So you can shoehorn these models uh, into ggplot2, but um, it is still a matter of shoehorning them in. And as I say, there are, there are plenty of extensions. I don't doubt that there are extensions to deal with many of the problems that he's illustrated here in future work. Okay, so let me conclude by saying that you should certainly read the paper, which deals with the contrast between the layered grammar and Wilkinson's grammar at a far greater level of detail than is hinted at in these brief slides. As the term progresses, we'll be looking at more of Wickham's work and that's built on this foundation. And there's a complete list of Wickham's work in the uh, syllabus. So thank you for your attention. Until next time.